millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious, and all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com etm. And use code ETM to choose your free offer and get $20 off. Shame can stop us from having conversations about money. Shame can stop us from thinking of ourselves as someone who is capable, abundant, someone who can hold money someone who can handle money. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. Money is this thing that we cannot avoid. We cannot avoid it. So why not have it be as nurturing, generative, eye-opening, weird, interesting, you know, as as we are? Everyone always asks me, how could I come up with a thousand different podcast episode show ideas? And I tell them, it's actually very easy because money is very complex. And even though you've been taught to believe it's simple, it is complex. But just because it's complex, it doesn't mean it has to be hard or soul crushing. That's what gets me excited to do this show. Whether we're talking about a classic money topic, like how to pay off your debt, or something more complex, like the emotions behind your money, there's just a lot to explore from a lot of different angles. Our guest, Sarah Gutsdiener, host of the podcast Moonbeaming and the owner of Moon Studio, is here to explore what we don't talk about when we talk about money. Juicy topics like shame, nervous system dysregulation, self-sabotage, something I know a lot about myself, and all our ancestral money trauma. And she's here to help you learn practical tools to create change. I'm Shauna. This is Everyone's Talking Money. Let's start talking. We've got a lot to talk about, uh, and I've been looking forward to this episode because You know, my passion is really to help everyone listening, you know, understand that finding money success, you know, whatever that looks like to you is, is about more than just having a ton of money. I think we could both agree that having a lot of money is, is always a good thing, but it just, it doesn't guarantee a happier life or that life gets better. And I think to, to find like true money success, I think we have to be willing to look at everything from a really kind of like holistic point of view. You know, how do we make money? How do we keep it? How do we grow it? But also 
you know, how do you internally feel about money? What's your money story? What are the beliefs that you have believed about money? Like what are the things that are that are getting you stuck? So we're here to talk about the things we don't talk about when we talk about money. <laughs> things yeah. like shame, nervous system, deregulation, self-sabotaging, epigenetics and ancestry. So I want to start with this idea of shame because I feel like it's something so prevalent. You know, tell me how does shame, how does that show up? How is it embodied when we talk about money? Oh, I mean, where isn't it embodied, right? Like I think in there, there is so much shame ultimately embedded in money because in general, our culture, not every person in the culture, but culturally, as far as I, I interpret it, we are in a scarcity-based culture, which means it's viewing things from a position of lack, a position of competition, a position of not enough. There's never enough. You know, th- we see millionaires wanting to become billionaires. We see billionaires wanting to fly to the moon when they could be solving hunger. You know, like we see this very chemically fueled, I would say historically fueled um, relationship with scarcity. And so what that ends up creating with many of us, whether it's unconscious or we can kind of see it and we can kind of feel it in our nervous systems and it kind of influence or it not kind of, it does influence our relationships, including that with money and work is shame, which is the feeling, uh, which is the emotion or sensation of I am unworthy, I will never be enough. Um, and that then ends up creating certain patterns that, of course, we're here to relearn and we're here to rewire. And that's why money and work are such fertile grounds for reworking our relationship with shame because of all of the programming internalized and externalized around not being enough, not having enough, how that ends up influencing our self perception and our relationships with other people. So it's a really great place to, you know, as my therapist would say, there's a lot of material there, right, that we can work with. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And so you talk about these these patterns, and I think you know one of the things that I, I love to do on this show is help people understand and and maybe kind of I don't know just have greater awareness of of the patterns that um, they have around money, why they do or don't do certain things, and I know shame is at at the core of you know so many of our relationship with money i know it's been at the relation you know core of my relationship with money for for quite some time and i've worked with hundreds of people and i would i would all you know regardless of situation come back to shame being kind of a cornerstone there you know but how does how does money shame or i guess what does it do to us like externally and then internally more, I think, because it's something we don't really self-examine very often. Yeah. I think shame, there's a couple of functions of shame. I think one function of shame is protection. I think that shame can protect us from experiencing more intense sensations, whether that be emotions or memories, or processing hard truths. I think shame can keep us separate from our authenticity and our desires. I think that when we take shame outside of the lens of it being bad, it serves a purpose. You know, every behavior we have whether right. it be staying up too late at night or overspending, or, you know, whatever that may be not talking about things, secrecy, like they all serve a purpose. Um, And when we, like I'm teaching a class right now on abundance. And one of the things we do, and I'm just bringing this up because I think some of the listeners might benefit from this. We have conversations in a mild meditative state 
with abundance, but we also have conversations with scarcity. And we listen to what scarcity wants to tell us. And often our scarcity, which is linked to shame, is around protection, is around wanting to keep us safe, is around fear that are linked to maybe some other limiting beliefs or things that happened to us when we were young that we haven't processed or things that have happened to us ancestrally that we carry along with us. And so I think that when we stop thinking of shame as a bad thing and start thinking about how we can detach ourselves from shame by being with shame and listening to shame and seeing what it's here to tell us, then we can begin to have more generative conversations. Then we don't become the shame because shame can stop us from having conversations about money. Shame can stop us from thinking of ourselves as someone who is capable, abundant, someone who can hold money, someone who can handle money. For me, I'll just share my personal story, uh, just a snippet of it for folks who can relate. For me, I have ADHD and dyscalculia, and I'm really bad with numbers. And I've always had- What's that? I've never even heard of that. Yeah. So it's like dyslexia, but for math. So I have mild dyslexia and I have it with numbers oh. where, yeah, a, like I fa- I almost failed out of every math class. Like didn't matter how, m- how much studying I did. Didn't matter if I stayed after school with the teacher. I could not get past basic math. And of course that influenced my relationship with money along with so many other things that I won't get into. But here's just something I want to share really quickly. ADHD Anyone who has a learning disability, you know, we can extend this to anyone who's been systemically oppressed, um, anyone who comes from a, a class in wi- a lower class or abject poverty where no one ever talked about money or there was no, um, there were no resources or support systems, right? Because money talk without class consciousness is like bypassing as far as I'm concerned, right? It's gaslighting as far as I'm concerned. But so if you have all like if you have one of these, if you have one of these things or all of these things or all of these intersecting identities and backgrounds. So for me, I'm just using ADHD. ADHD comes with a lot of shame. You always feel different. You can never quite in quote like get what everyone gets. Like you're on a different track. And so what I had to do I had to rely on my creativity, which is another thing I teach, is we want to lean into our natural strengths and our natural resources when we are transforming our relationship to things that are painful or challenging. So I had to get really creative and really intuitive with money. And what that meant for me as someone with ADHD who has um, different kinds of like object permanence, blindness, and things like that, I literally had to create my own system around money in which I have about seven different bank accounts. One is for my bills. One is for savings. One is my FU fund. One is a vacation I'm planning on. The other thing I've had to do, I do it sometimes, not always, but I had to do it in the beginning when I was first starting out with changing my relationship to money, is I just took out money and cash. And that was, for example, all I could spend on food that month. And that was a way for me to deal with some of my challenges, having ADHD, which is like out of sight, out of mind. This is why it's so hard for people with ADHD to pay bills, to open mail. Um, We have issues with disorganization. I had to find a way that worked for me that maybe if someone else looking in, maybe they would make fun of me. Maybe it wouldn't make sense to them, but it helped me a lot figure out how to have a relationship with money That was generative. Another, and then I'll stop and and let you ask another question or chime in. Another for me with ADHD (laughs) is gamification, gamification, making money fun, making money a challenge, giving myself quick wins uh, so that I could keep my dopamine going, right? Um, And I had to figure that out for myself. The ADHD brain does love games, does love challenges. A lot of uh, my practice is also energetic and 
magical and nervous system. So I, I had to bring a lot of those things on board as well. But those are some of the components. So we have to start where we are. We can't just think that the advice from the hedge fund bro who's like classic capitalist, go, 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 you know, infinite growth, stop at nothing, F people over. We can't take advice from those kinds of people because it's not specific enough and it's not an integrity with who we really are. And we have to figure that out first and start from there. And then we'll be able to see really beautiful change and results. I'm really thank you so much for for sharing that story, Sarah. I it made me think about uh, somebody that I worked with a couple of years ago who she had asked a bunch of money experts for help. She had paid a bunch of people, and everyone kept coming back to her and telling her that she was doing everything wrong, you know, and that she um, was never going to be able to reach her money goals. And so she came to me just sort of you know, totally down, head hanging down and said, you know, you're, you're sort of my last hope. Like, can you help me? And she explained, she also had ADHD and she had a, um, uh, bipolar, right. And so when she would have these moments, she would get really manic with her spending and she just couldn't find somebody to, to set up a system that really worked for her. So we did a lot of like what you're describing here. We set up uh, a series of different uh, savings accounts and bank accounts. And one of them was labeled manic spending. And so yes. whenever she would have one of these moments, she could go to that account and that was her yes. specific account that she could buy whatever the heck she wanted, no judgment from that account. And so we set up this whole system to really work with who she was and how she operated rather than trying to change who she was, right? And it's, I, that's what I love what you're sharing is, you know, when, we, when we're talking about shame or something like that, it's, it's you know, not f- coming at it, not from this place of just wanting to get rid of it or saying this is bad, you know, you should not be that person. But how do we work kind of within the constraints of who you are to set something up that is, is going to be really beneficial to you and really nurturing? 100%. I love that story because I had a exact same similar experience with a client and we made a joke that she was like for half of the month she was like good Kermit and then for half she was evil Kermit. And so we exact same story. There was a <laughs> amount of money that she could just evil Kermit buy the shoes, buy the ice cream, like do, you know, whatever and and it was fine, you know? And so I love I love that. I love that. I think we are in this really beautiful time where we're recognizing that what we've been led to believe about money, wealth, stability, the American dream, whatever, what have you. I know you've had a lot of guests on your show who talk about this. You know, it it might have been a lie. It might have not been for us. And Again, like I don't want to take advice from someone who hasn't specifically dealt with some of the challenges I have faced. And I think because of the rise in our access to different stories, the awakening that we've got to get our mindset in a certain space, yes, but we've also have to have our nervous system on board, our emotions on board. We have to really interrogate. I talk a lot about the symbolism of money and what money symbolizes for us. Because so, for example, say money symbolizes a lot of times too in my classes, it'll be paradoxical. Money will symbolize, say, both security and freedom. Um for example. So if you have that, if you know that's important to you and your values, you can experience that in your body. You can begin to sensation track and freedom map in your life. And you can start moving towards and orienting towards how you want to feel and how you want to be around money. Absolutely. And also in all of the other ways where you can just get started right now. I don't need money 
to feel more secure in my body. I need nervous system regulation, you know? Uh, I need emotional intelligence. I need to feel like I belong to myself and I belong to the world or I belong to a couple of close friends. So we can, again, we can start wherever we are, wherever we are, and we can expand outwards. Um, And then, of course, ironically, the more we can experience the feelings of what we would like money to give us, the easier it becomes to generate more wealth or at the very least generate more experiences that bring us closer to who we are and what we would like to experience more of in this life. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. So tell me more about the nervous system and how, how do we bring it into, um, how, how do we regulate it? How do we get it to a place that it's actually going to be beneficial uh, as we're you know developing in our, our relationship with money? Yes, I love this conversation. I've done some work with my students. I've done some work with my clients around this. I Just as a caveat, like an aside, a lot of folks who are drawn to my work are highly sensitive people. Shocking. I'm highly sensitive. Um, And they also have a (laughs) So am I. Good company. Yeah. You know, HSPs. Here we are. Living, loving, laughing. 
Um, and then they also often have a history of trauma. And again, I think that's a lot of people, you know, I don't, I, I would like to end the stigma. Uh, I think if anything, like the past three to six years have given many of us trauma collectively. So I just want to be really open about that. And it doesn't mean you're broken. It doesn't mean that you can't live a joyful life. I am certainly proof of that. And I'm sure you are as well. So I just want to have that as an aside. So this advice, again, might not work for everyone. But I do think that nervous system education is definitely one of the things I wish I was taught when I was, you know, eight years old, seven years old. Um, I think it should be taught in school just as like alongside gym class or something like that. Or I don't even know what they're teaching anymore in school. But anyway, anyhow, our nervous system is one of the brains in our body. That's why I say money work isn't just mindset work because we have a couple of other brains in our body. We have our gut. We have our nervous system. We have our heart. And all of these are giving us information. Studies have shown that often it's our body that gives our brain more information than our brain giving our body more information. So developing an awareness of what our nervous system is doing, why and when, linking that to the thoughts that come up, the emotions that come up, and the responses that come up are really, really useful. So I'm going to give a very practical, very simple example of this that I think folks can relate to. I had a client. Yes, and go for we, it. <laughs> yeah. I had a client and she realized that every time she went to send an invoice, she went into a freeze response. So what that meant was she numbed out, she became disassociated, she became lethargic, her body became rigid, and she didn't want to send the invoice, okay? It felt like physically very uncomfortable for her to send the invoice. This was, this is not um, a strange thing. You know, like I think as someone who works with creatives, I'm like, can you please send the invoice in? Like, we want to pay you, you know, like it takes a while, <laughs> but, you know, and so, you know what I mean? So what we interrogated was that she had, now we're going back to shame and the feeling and the sh now we're going back to shame and shame protecting us from a different sensation or a different experience. When we did some interrogation, this was around her ability to receive, and this was around other beliefs she had around overwork or not being able to get paid for what she liked doing or to get paid for what was in her zone of genius. And through a series of somatic experiencing, meditation, movement work, little by little, by slowing down the nervous system, introducing new thoughts, doing things to gently get her out of that freeze response, things that looked like gentle movement, things that looked like softening the body, and also pre-paving, meaning when she wasn't sending the invoice, like say she's on a walk and she's feeling great, she's feeling good, she's feeling connected to her body, having her do visualization work of her sending an invoice with ease, receiving the money in her bank account, joyfully receiving it, giving thanks, spent giving some of that money to a cause, you know, things that started rewiring not just right, her yeah. mindset, but her behavior, her nervous system, and her ability to contact safety flow but at it, but at the very baseline neutrality and or the ability for her to be with herself as uncomfortable disconcerting things came up to give herself the space when we give ourselves the spaciousness around discomfort and we give ourselves compassionate a compassionate witness then those feelings of shame 
can begin to transform over time. And then the receipts, as it were, of trust begins to build because she's like, oh, you know what? I've sent three invoices in the last month. I'm changing. I'm growing. Maybe it wasn't easy. Maybe it took me longer than I would have liked. But you know what? I did it. And I'm changing right now. And I'm doing this thing. And yeah, it's challenging. And I am not perfect about it. But I'm in a period of transformation and growth. And that's why we do that little by little, like one breath, one nervous system response at a time. And this is also how we create sustainable long-term change. And that's what I'm all about. I'm like, who cares if you have, if, I mean, yes, a million dollars is amazing. A million dollars is great. Like bring it on, right? I want everyone to have everything that they need and more. And also I would love it if our nervous systems were regulated. I would love it if we felt like we were receiving that without having to overwork ourselves. Uh, If we felt like we didn't have to contort ourselves. Like I think that's where we're all headed towards as a culture because it doesn't have to be this way. And we all are kind of waking up to that fact, I think, now, or at least your listeners probably are, you know, because these are the things you talk about. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to Nerd Wallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before Nerd Wallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. <laughs> I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Yeah, I mean, this just makes me like so excited. I've got like hairs standing up on my arms, if you could see them right now, because I'm I'm writing a book and you know, I'm I'm really diving into this idea that I talk about on this show all the time. And I think you're you're putting, you know, exclamation marks behind this that, you know, we get to a point in life, most of us, where we're like, wow, we have all these things that we want to do and all these goals we have, and like we're not getting any closer to them. Like, what's going on? So you you go out searching for, uh, I, I call it the how-tos, you know, how do I buy a house? How do I set up a business? How do I pay off my debt? How do I, and you'll get a list, a laundry list of the steps you take, but that doesn't actually create the change. And what I know is most people get that laundry list of things to do and you just don't do them, right? And so what I love about this conversation is, you know, money is so much more complex than just the how-tos, that's about 10% of the equation of success. The other 90% is this, um, you know, whole system that's, that's working behind the scenes. And these are subjects that make me really excited because I feel like in, in mainstream, uh, you know, money expert arena, if you will, these are the things that aren't, aren't really talked about. And I, I think it's, it's really important just to even, you know, crack the door to help somebody listening right now, like think about think about these things. And another thing I really wanted to to talk to you about is uh, self sabotage because you know I feel like the older I get, uh, the more self sabotage <laughs> kind of comes into play. And I I hope I'm not the only one that feels that way. I hope somebody else listening kind of feels that same way. But you know what is it what does it look like? We've talked about shame. We talked about our nervous system. But what does it look like to you know, self-sabotage ourselves than when it comes to money. Wow. Yeah. I mean, one thing that just popped up in my head is that self-sabotage can also be a sign that you are growing, right? Because you're at some kind of edge. You're at some kind of like crossroads I'm almost seeing for you um, where you are – you know, you're, you're really, you've gotten down to the roots, right? You're like, okay, here I am. And 
there is like the most natural thing. This is the other thing I want to demystify. I say this to all my students. The most natural thing that happens when we're ready to expand, when we're ready to widen our capacity, our capacity to receive, to widen our capacity of what we think is possible for us or of who we are, is we're going to get resistance. We're going to get resistance uh, because, I mean, there's so many reasons, and I teach about this a lot, so I'll spare everyone the, the, the long, long story, but just really simply, really, really simply, we are biologically wired to conserve energy. We also are biologically wired to have a negative bias because we needed to remember what berry in the woods was poisonous. We had to remember those. We had to remember the tree, the berry, the tiger that was, you know, going to hurt us more so that our survival would be dependent on it. So the first thing I want to say with you or with anyone too is I think when we're noticing ourselves self-sabotaging, we want to look at or we want to interrogate what survival stories are coming up that were created in us before we, we might have been pre-verbal, right? Because also studies have shown, and I know you know this because I know you talk about this and you talk about this on this show. I was reading a study where things that have happened to us when we're pre-verbal, right? So before maybe two or three, they live in our brain in a different way because we don't have language for them. We might have sensations. They might be living in our brain in a less compartmentalized way, in a way where we can't necessarily locate them. And that's also why I think body work, somatic experiencing, nervous system work, creative work, like art therapy, uh, hypnosis is really an EMDR, you know, whatever, pick your, pick your modality, dance, you know, gardening, whatever works for you to, to get into your body <laughs> and to get out of these kind of survival patterns. It feels like you're brushing up against this, this, like these last kinds of barriers for yourself when you're catching yourself self-sabotaging. And we want to look at, or at least I'll just speak for myself, when I catch myself there, because I'm in a, I, I'm glad you're bringing this up because I'm in a season of this as well, where I'm like, babe, why are you still doing this again? Like you, we, we're smart people. We do mindset work. We can see ourselves like in this pattern, you know, um, one, it could be that we're not quite ready. Like we, we got to edge, you know, Two, it could be that we're bumping up against some really, really old ingrained patterns around survival, you know, and we want to feel safe and we have to figure out how to feel safe in a different way because the ways that we've internalized, um, I, you know, I also, sorry, I have some, I'm a, I'm an intuitive. And so all of these images are coming into my brain. All of these ideas are coming into my brain around this, and I'm thinking it I might love be it. Yes, it, it might be something you might want to look into, but it might be something that listeners want to look into. We kind of uh, what we do in my classes are again, we don't try to use this forceful, violent, patriarchal override, you know, tactic with ourselves where we just like feel the burn and do it anyway, and like you know, th that's old school. That's so old paradigm. It, it works for some people, but it doesn't work for most of us. We, so in my classes, we talk to the ego. We talk to the shadow. Like I said, we listen to what scarcity has to say to us. So you might want to negotiate with the negative parts of the ego that are like, no, we have to do it this way so we can feel safe. Or no, we have to keep this part of our dream locked away. You might want to do some reparenting work. You might want to do some journaling. You might want to do some talking to that aspect of yourself. And just and then once they've gotten their chance, again, whether with a processor, in hypnotherapy, with a therapist, in your journal, whatever, you might want to gently reparent them and say, hey, 
we're going to try doing it this way. Are you on board? How can I get you on board? What do you need? You know, instead of trying, like what human beings do, and this is nervous system work as well, we very often will override or will avoid. We will override or we'll avoid. And that goes in with our nervous system responses. And it makes perfect sense. There's there's nothing wrong with you or nothing shameful. I do it all the time. I'm always doing, uh, I'm always catching myself in particular with like my, my partner and I, we do this a lot. I'm like, oh my gosh, babe, I'm like trying to override. I'm I'm getting defensive. I, I just need to sit down and listen. You know, like we do this all the time. So it, there's nothing wrong. It's like how we learn to survive. So I think being gentle, I think taking a different approach with it. The last thing I want to say, and then I, I, I swear I'll stop, is I read this study, and I've been trying it in my own life, where it takes about, on average, a hundred times or so for us to create new neuro pathways, new beliefs, new habits, a hundred times before we learn how to tie our shoe. There was a study shown that if you combined a new thought belief or a new habit with play, with gentle movement, it took like 10 times less to rewire. So what I'm trying to say is, yeah, like making it fun, like when you're in a neutral space or a fun space, like dancing around giving like saying out loud your new beliefs you know doing things like when you cuddle with your animals just choosing what thoughts you want to think you know and inviting in play and silliness and levity and just see what changes with that see what see if that disarms the self sabotaging part that lives within all of us that really just wants to be assured that they're going to be okay I am going to enter into more play <laughs> because I definitely need that in my life. If you, somebody that knows me personally, you know that uh, I tend to be a little bit more serious. <laughs> my husband says <laughs> I'm always way too pragmatic. So mm-hmm. I am going to bring in some of that play. And I want to touch on a little uh, something. I mean, you, you, so many different gems you just shared here, but I want to touch a little bit on ancestry because you talked about that and epigenetics. You know, I was thinking about this uh, a couple of days ago. My uh, my grandma Hilda, my dad's mom, she um, was kind of a trailblazer entrepreneur before that was hip and before women did that. She ran her own salon out of her house and she worked all of the time. She lived through the Great Depression. And, you know, my theory is she died when I was fairly young, so I, I didn't get to have any of these conversations with her. But my theory was she worked all of the time because she just did not want to have to uh, not have money again, you know, if something else really bad happened in, in the world. And that was kind of how she nurtured herself. But, you know, my father, my dad learned that that same sensibility and he is in his 80s and he will tell you he is not going to stop working until the day he passes away. That is just what he loves and it's become such a fabric of who he is and you know i see a lot of those same tendencies in myself and i try to not embody <laughs> working all of the time but it's it definitely consumes a lot of my brain because i i love what i do and so it's just really interesting to me how you know when you start to think about your ancestry and you start to think about you know i don't know before my grandma hilda you know what the tendencies were and what the patterns were and what the thoughts around money were i don't have access to that but it's really interesting to me to try to try and you know kind of dissect things and really look at like okay why do I do certain things that I do you know so I'm really interested like tell me a little bit more about you know the role that our you know ancestry stories and links and beliefs and all that plays into kind of our current money situation yes this is such a great question i love your share uh it's so rich because there's so much there. You you could spend some time journaling about or even again I'm 
a witch, so this may not vibe with everyone listening, but you could create an, a small altar to your grandmother, Hilda, where you have her picture, you have an offering to her, and you can ask her to give you information about her beliefs or what she needed or why, you know, she was doing what she was doing. I, yeah. Yeah. You know, or just journal or just talk about it in therapy or talk about it with your partner or wherever you feel safe. Um, maybe your grandmother can come visit you in dreams or through her favorite flowers or favorite colors or things like that just to kind of see. But yeah, I mean, science has shown epigenetically, you know, I'm, I'm Jewish, so I have a, my own, you know, ancestral stuff around money big time. And I share in one of my classes, Money Alchemy, that when I was privileged enough to talk to my grandfather about some of his memories, one of the memories he shared about his grandfather who came here from Europe with almost nothing was that the only time he saw his grandfather was on Shabbat because it was the only time, you know, most, not all, but religious and observant Jews do not work on Shabbat. But the rest of the week, his father left before he woke up in the morning and came home when he was already asleep and in bed. And, you know, that is its own story. That is a cellular, molecular carrier of overwork, overexertion. And also, I think similar to your, to you, to your grandmother, quite frankly, something that, that uh, my great grandfather loved doing. He loved, he ended up um, literally being a rag seller when he first got to this country and then ended up owning a factory. So like in his lifetime in like 30, 40 years, and he loved clothing. And, and so like for me, there is this element and I'm sure you can relate where I love what I do. And I have to be really careful not to be a workaholic. I have to be really careful not to overexert myself uh, because I have some stuff around self-worth. Yes. And from a very young age, I, it was programmed in me that the only way I was – the only way money was worth it or like the only way I could comfortably receive money was if it was difficult. If I was working very hard, then it was then it was okay for me to make six figures. You know what I mean? But if it's like easy and joyful and passive income and like just fun and like like that is much more difficult for me. And so I've been spending the last about mm, four to five years working on this pattern. So the thing I also want to say to listeners is like this isn't like the listicles that are like three ways to change your life in three days. Like it's not like that. It takes – <laughs> yeah, you know, it takes consistency and sometimes it gets too intense or sometimes like life gets in the way and you have to figure out some other stuff. You have to caretake or you get long COVID or you lose your job or, you know, life happens and you can't just always be doing this uh, self-work. Of course, hello, it's a privilege to be able to do it. But my point is what I always tell my students about ancestry epigenetics is if you do not have access to your story because a lot of people don't, right? Um, for various, various reasons, get really quiet, get really still and put your hand on your heart and you can ask, what were my family members trying to heal? What was a belief that my ancestry had through no fault of their own through their own survival stories? And what gifts have I been given by my ancestral line that can help me heal or step into repair around some of these challenges? Because our ancestors give us gifts too. Our, like our ans- the reason we're here is because our ancestors were incredibly creative. You know, like they survival is inherently incredibly right, sure. creative. So we can't just be like, uh, you know, uh, like a lot of students I'll get who are white, they they have a lot of white guilt. Um, you know, maybe in their ancestry, some terrible things happened from what their ancestors did. 
And there are pluses and minuses, and it's all very complicated, and it's for us to parse through. But we don't have to make it complicated. We can go bit by bit. We can get simple. We can see what feels good to rewrite. rewrite, And we can, um, yeah, we can go at the pace that we need to go at personally. Well, I feel like we we've just kind of like tipped the iceberg in this episode. I mean, there's been so much we've talked about and and so much more to to dive into, but you know, as we as we wrap up, I just I want to leave everyone listening with you know, some little some little nugget. Sarah, you know, why do you think it's important that we spend time talking about this stuff about money that we don't normally talk about or that we don't normally explore like why why do this work why dive into this money can be a language of how we relate to ourselves in the world it doesn't have to be boring It doesn't have to be the same as what we've been taught. A lot of people listening to your show, I think, are inherently creative. Again, as I've said, all humans are. We can get creative with it, and it can be a doorway, an opening to different kinds of repair because money is this thing that we cannot avoid. We cannot avoid it. So why not have it be as nurturing, generative, eye-opening, weird, interesting, you know, as as we are? This episode just kind of hit home for me in a really big way. If I'm being honest, I have dealt with all the topics we talked about. Shame, nervous system out of whack, self-sabotage, And I've also grappled with my ancestry and the money beliefs that have been passed down for generations. But I I loved how Sarah walked us through these heavy topics. So you see, money, yeah, it's simple, but it's also very complex. But it doesn't have to remain hard or stressful. So hopefully this episode just opened the door for you to explore how these topics also show up in your life. If you want to connect with Sarah, you can find her podcast, Moonbeaming, wherever you're listening to this podcast right now. You can also find her at Moon Studio, and the web address is moon-studio.co. If you enjoyed this episode, uh, you know what to do. Share with a few friends right now. Invite them into this simple yet very complex world of money. As always, you can head to the show notes for all the links to our episode guests, as well as the sponsors who make this show possible. I'll see you back here, my friend, in a few days for a brand new episode. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC.